Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another very, very special episode of The Culture Cauldron. I'm Maya here again um, in a very incredible space around me. Uh, in celebration of International Women's Month, we are here in the Matilda Jocelyn Gage Foundation. I am here with Ms. Heather Water Waters, who helps work in the space and just keeps everything in tip top shape and just really represents everything that Matilda really had to show. And well, one, first, thank you so much for having us here and thank you for joining us in this interview. So thank you so much for coming. We are delighted to have you on behalf of Dr. Sally Roche Wagner, who really brought Gage back, and Melissa Almeida. We are thrilled to have you. Well, you know, we're in the space that Matilda Gage was in a lot, and a lot of people don't really know her story or really know all that she did for the women's movement. I would love if you could just fill everyone in on, in on what she did, how she contributed to the movement, how con she contributed to many movements, and then we can just kind of go from there if you like. Sure. I'd be happy to tell you, she was amazing. She lived here 44 years. She was born in Cicero to an abolitionist family. So she came to Manlius and then Fayetteville. And she was a visionary in a lot of ways. She was someone who, for the first time, her first public speech was speaking at the, um, the Women's Rights Convention in Syracuse, the third one that had ever been convened. And she was 26 years old. She had her six-year-old daughter in tow. And that really is a, a way to sort of encompass the kind of person she was. She was passionate and she had, you know, had really deep conviction um, and explored lots of different rights, women's rights issues, but also the larger piece of, of human liberation. Um, yeah, and so she, w along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, she worked to, to really be the leader of the women's rights movement and the suffrage movement in the US. And she's, she goes unacknowledged way too often. So we're here to, to, to bring her back. Well, I think it's amazing that you're bringing her back because, you know, those two names, a lot of feminists like myself know and a lot of people that know the movement know as well. And, you know, we know that the movement really started in Seneca Falls. But the real thing we didn't learn is that the reason Seneca Falls was such an implemental space is that it related to a lot of the indigenous groups and indigenous people and women that were around the women actually uh, igniting this movement for America. So if you'd like to go into that a little bit, I'd, I'd love for everyone to know. Totally. Uh, that is pretty, pretty new for people to sort of digest, and it is so important to know. Uh, we've heard about how maybe founding fathers in the U.S. learned about the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and were influenced when they were putting together um, the new form of government for the U.S., but people didn't really dig in um, generally to wonder why was it in Seneca Falls, why in the heart of the, the Six Nations was the women's rights movement sort of bl blossoming. And Lucretia Mott um, spent time with, this, with the Senecas and Matilda and others spent time with, with the, the Oneidas and the Onondagas and basically, Without a Whisper is a film that just came out, and you can check this out, but it's a great way to, to learn about sort of the influence that indigenous women had on the women we know today as the women right, women's rights leaders. I don't think everything started in Seneca Falls. Well, I definitely think that's, a, well, it's called Without a Whisper, right? Yes, Everybody check it out. stream Without a Whisper. I <laughs> it's definitely am. streaming on PBS okay. and the uh, Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian um, is, is hosting it, so it's easy to find. And then I think one thing that this house really, or the space really represents is intersectionality. You yeah. know, we're in a Wizard of Oz room, which I'll get yeah. into a little bit, but there's yeah, also the an, ab an abolition room um, for the Underground Railroad. There's an indigenous room, you know, and you never get to see so many of these movements and so many of these spaces placed in such a connectivity or really just a connection. So, you know, how did Matilda represent intersectionality that, you know, a lot of us Gen Z's are really big on, but, you know, her doing it all like almost two centuries ago, how do you think that really can be, um, how do I say, like motivated for us now and how can it be implemented and represented today? Yeah, I, I think it's so cool. It's one of the reasons that I'm so passionate um, about Matilda and so excited to be a part of the foundation. You know, I think it was, as I understand it, it was Gloria Steinem who said that Matilda was ahead of the women who were ahead of their time. And she was was someone who was a free thinker um, and she truly like part of the three th free thinking society and was deeply committed to looking at the interference of the church into the state and the, the dangers around that. She, so that's really interesting and relevant to today. She was 
adopted by the Mohawk clan um, as a member. She, you know, was someone who um, would have things to say about reproductive justice today. Uh, absolutely. She was there actually, um, she was there when, when people were being arrested for having um, pamphlets about birth control, um, you know, back in the day. She was someone who um, was supportive of abolition and was, was interested in making sure that um, she was part of the Underground Railroad. And so here at the, in, at the foundation, you can take part and, and see some uh, the kinds of, we have a bookcase where you can see how people were actually hidden. Um, and with the Oz connection is pretty cool. In this room, you'll see Dorothy's slippers and, you know, Matilda married, uh, Matilda's daughter Maud married L. Frank Baum, who was from Chittenango. And he had told these stories to their children, to, to Maud and, and Frank's children. And Matilda was older, living with them part-time in Chicago. And she heard them and she encouraged him to write them down. And now we have the wonderful Wizard of Oz. Well, I mean, everyone has obvious reasons to come visit. So thank you so much for having us. Everyone, please come see this foundation and see this space and, you know, learn what Matilda represented. And thank you so much for having me here. I feel so lucky to be here. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks.